Are you also afraid? Do you feel the suffering of the planet? Do you feel life leaving the forests? Do you maybe live in an area under threat by increased wildfires, floods, or hurricanes? Are you also confused what to do about it, other than eating less meat, flying less? This is Studio Bonn Global Nerve Systems, a space where we don't educate each other on climate change, but take a step back, take a step back and reflect on how it actually feels like. And we will do that with the help of climate psychologist Rebecca Nestor, artist Lu Yang, and climate activist Zoe Ruge from Letzte Generation. Please give a warm hand. Welcome to How to Cope with Fear, our second talk in the series Global Nerve Systems at Studio Bonn. Studio Bonn is the public think tank of the Art and Exhibition Hall of the Federal Republic of Germany, where I, my name is Kolja Reichert, am one of seven curators, which reminds me of the seven dwarfs, which we will also hear about later. Studio Bonn is all about global communal infrastructures, in this case, the infrastructure of our imagination and our emotions which are a crucial factor in facing climate change, as Rebecca Nestor can explain. Rebecca, would you please introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Rebecca Nestor. I'm a climate psychologist, and that means that I study the impact of the climate crisis, climate change, whatever you like to call it, on, our, on uh, human beings emotionally, and therefore how that might affect our behavior. And can I ask you, can I go like personally directly, what's your biggest, deepest, or most productive fear? My deepest fear is that something will happen to my son, who was born in 1994, just as climate change was beginning. And my fear is that anything might happen to him, but my fear specifically is in relation to his life as our climate changes. Thank you. Zoe, can you introduce yourself? I'm Zoe Ruge, I'm 23 years old and I'm part of the movement Letzte Generation um, because I decided that I want to use my democratic right to protest and use one of the most effective ways right now to urge our government to still take care and protect our lives. Thank you. And you just took the train from Berlin where you have been active in the protests in the past two weeks which aim to block the whole capital of Germany. Can I ask you for your deepest fear? I think um, one of my deepest fear is not directly um, to face the consequences of the climate crisis, but I'm afraid that the ignorance that I see right now in our society, this unwillingness to, to tackle climate crisis and to think about possibilities, how we can as a society, as a community together, um, live with the consequences of climate crisis, um, that that grows and that that gets more stronger. Um, and I think that's one of my biggest fears that I feel like we might be un, not able or not willing to face the consequences mm -hmm. and deal with them. Thank you. I've also seen you recently in a theater play here in Bonn by the director Volk Volker Lösch. Um, which is called uh, The Right to Youth, where you also um, act, and we will hear more about that later, but that provided also a space um, to reflect on the challenges um, of actually raising a consciousness. But raising a consciousness sounds hugely so abstract and it has been said so many times. Um, tonight we want to go deeper um, and more personal uh, without any kitsch, but we really want to understand the global nerve systems that run through our imaginations. and. Um, this is a good moment to ask Lu Yang to introduce yourself, please. Can you hear me okay? 
Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Liu Yang, and I'm a artist, but I would rather describe myself as a creator. I've created quite a lot of work of art, including aspects of Buddhism. I think actually a lot of my work has to do with the theme of this evening, with a light motif. A lot of it is really how to from a religious or from a scientific perspective and, and point of view deal with fear. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lou. And uh, you're joining from Tokyo, actually. So um, that's a very sustainable way of changing a long flight uh, for a long night. Thanks for being with us, even at two in the night. Um, Lu Yang's art is amazing. You should see it. You can see it online, especially the film Doku the Self, which we will talk about more tonight, um, and which was premiered at the Venice Biennial in last year. Um, and it's also at show at the, Bundes in, in the, at the Kunsthalle Basel uh, right now in a solo exhibition. Um, Lu does games, uh, video installations. Uh, you would see like Buddhist temple flags hanging through the space, and in the end, like a gaming aesthetic, like psychedelic, pumping techno, um, uh, dancing avatars and gods. Um, and I'm especially interested tonight to hear more of what um, Lu learned from his engagement with Buddhism. But first, I want to credit these graphics we see flying around here. Um, they were done by Pali Palavatanan, who was a guest at the last Global Nerve Systems Studio Bonn. Um, and he again brought us these amazing graphics. The music you heard was by musician Aisha Devi, who more and more tends to work with healing sounds, uh, which she learned in Nepal. Aisha will also be soon with us at Global Nerve Systems. Um, you all hold an object of nature in your hand. Uh, for me, it is this feather that I just found on the roof uh, of Bundeskunsthalle. We have a park upstairs. Um, when I was walking around with Zoe and Rebecca. Um, and before we go like deeper into your personal stories um, and your work, I wanted to ask you, Rebecca, um, what expects us tonight? Like, what will we do with these objects we hold in our hands? Well. Perhaps without saying too much of the detail of what we will do, um, I would encourage you to keep holding your objects and as you, as you do, maybe you'll notice thoughts, memories, um, connections, associations that will come up. Um, this is not to say, of course, that you shouldn't be paying attention to what's going on here. That's, um, that's also very important. But while you're doing that, if you hold sniff, um, touch, think about, engage with, get to know your, your object. What we will then do partway through the evening is invite you to speak with um, a very small group of people privately um, about what thoughts and feelings have come up for you in relation to your, your natural object. And some of these natural objects, this one I also found on the roof, and they are, they're very clearly beautiful. Others are not so beautiful, and that's part of what we're doing with them this evening, is to um, explore what actually it feels like to relate to the natural world, not just to look at it and be impressed by it. Thank you. You might know that Bonn was the capital of Germany until 1991, and you might also know that Beethoven actually lived here. But do you also know that here, a few kilometers just up the Rhine River, beyond the Seven Mountains, with the seven dwarfs, is where some of the most famous fairy tales are settled, like Snow White. You, Rebecca, went there yesterday and had a walk in the Seven Mountains and collected these objects. Um, what is your experience of Bonn? Well, the Seven Mountains, um, I, was, I think I was expecting something from Grimm's fairy tales, mm -hmm. um, which my father read to me when I was a child, and I have a very comforting memory of sitting on his lap and listening to um, one, one, of those, one of those fairy tales. I don't now remember which one, um, but the comfort that I remember from being on his lap and listening to a story, which was a bit frightening, um, is what I was taking with me into the walk. And, and what I found was something much more, um, much tidier, much cleaner, 
much, um, much less frightening in that sense than I was expecting. Um, and with lots of appropriate rules about what you could, where you could walk and where you couldn't walk. Um, and also a lot of wealth. It's a nature um, reserve. It's a nature it's reserve a and we need place. to protect it, exactly. And there was also a sense that this was a, a, a place for wealthy people to enjoy themselves and to look out over the view of, of this beautiful valley. Um, so I had a, mi a mixed set of feelings about it because a lot of my feelings were delight and joy and how beautiful this is and memories of childhood fairy tales, but also the sense that I have when I go anywhere where, where, where human wealth has had an impact is to feel a little bit, okay, this, this was maybe a thousand years ago, this place was wild and frightening and now where's all that gone? Um, it's gone into the stories, perhaps, and it's gone into how we how we talk about it. But it's it's not there in the personal experience anymore. Mm -hmm. So people working in stone quarrels at the Dragon Rock uh, in the Seven Mountains, they were turned into dwarfs for fairy tales, right? Yes. Into, into resources for material. Just at the moment, actually, when industrialization uh, took ground, and also the collecting of national myths and stories was um, actually served to um, um, I mean, produce national narratives yep. um, and the national state. And, and, and there we have it in Dragon Rock where also Lord Byron actually write, wrote poems and kicked off English romanticism. There you also have uh, a huge villa by, um, by a banker from Cologne from 19th century where the wealth is contracted, right? Yes. Zoe, um, you came this morning from Berlin Yeah. Um, you have been busy gluing yourself to the street and before I ask you why you do that, we will quickly see a video of you in an action in Freiburg where you recently finished your bachelor in liberal arts and science. Can we have the sound on the video? Ich sitze heute friedlich auf der Straße, weil ich mich dem Weiter so der Regierung entgegenstellen muss, in der Situation, in der wir uns heutzutage befinden. Ich kann nicht einfach weiter studieren, ich kann nicht einfach weiter meinem Alltag nachgehen, wenn ich weiß, dass wir weiterhin in fossile Infrastruktur ähm, investieren. Ich fordere Stopp den fossilen Wahnsinn und ich fordere euch auf, setzt euch friedlich, zivil mit uns auf die Straße. Kommt zu unseren Vorträgen in allen Städten in Deutschland, hier in Freiburg um 18 Uhr und informiert euch über zivilen Widerstand. Es hat in der Geschichte gezeigt, dass wenn wir friedlich demonstrieren, wenn wir friedlich uns auf die Straße setzen und sagen, wir stellen uns dem entgegen, es ist unsere demokratische Pflicht, dann können wir etwas verändern, alle zusammen. Super, vielen Dank für deinen Mut. Willst du deinen... Kind of love the ending when the policeman uh, asks you in 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 Badish, in, in in southwestern German accent, mm -hmm. are you already glued? Mm -hmm. And you say, yep. There is also the routine that many uh, police people have to deal with right now in many cities in Germany, but also many activists uh, deal with. Um, the principle is easy: you glue yourself to the street, police and. Um, 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 fire people um, have to use uh, chemicals to get you off and carry you away. But Letzte Generation actually got more traction and got famous with a different kind of action, gluing themselves to paintings. And we will see also some photos to remind us of these iconic media pictures that they produced. Here in the Dresdner Gemälde Galerie in August 2022, where two activists glued themselves to the 16 Madonna by Raphael. Um, The director of the museum, Marion Ackermann, declared that luckily the frame was not old but new and therefore no damage was produced. Um, next picture, please. Also in August 2022 in the Gemälde Galerie in Berlin, um, Lukas Kranachs, um, the elder, um, the rest on the flight to Egypt. Um, I think the activist on the left side was just You told me today being... She was, uh, she was sentenced last uh, week in front of the court in Berlin um, for this and for one street blockade that didn't um, 
produce any traffic. Um, and the sentence was uh, five months of jail without, um, what's it, Bewährung? Yeah. Without probation. Yeah. Five months without probation. Um, there's very different, uh, like, uh, court rules at the moment for your kind of activism. You are also in court sometimes defending people on you of a professional lawyer. Mm -hmm. Why do you do that? Like, why wouldn't you take a professional lawyer to defend mm -hmm. yourself? We do have a lot of professional lawyers that support us and that um, support the core cause um, because they are convinced that what we do does not have to be sentenced as hard as it is. It is uh, sometimes happens right now. Um, I do so because I'm convinced that we do not have to be sentenced and I'm convinced that our courts in Germany can see that and if I as, a, as a, an educated citizen um, lay out arguments where I think this, this is something we must do at the moment and this is something that not, must not be sentenced as hard, um, I think that's a chance to have a very honest discussion with the people who sit in the courts. So sitting there as a human um, changes actually the atmosphere in the court, that's your experience. Does it also lead to different indictments? Um, it does, but we also see a lot of different directions in the courts right now. We don't see a clear line. Um, I did defend um, in court or helped a friend um, defending himself in front of court when he was, um, we kind of produced, I guess, the first free sentence, so he was not sentenced for three street blockades. Um, and I think that's, that's not saying that we don't need professional lawyers, um, but it's saying that we, similar to when we take, take our protest to the streets, we can take action and we can be confident in acting in a democratic way also in front of the courts. Mm -hmm. Can we see another um, picture? It actually shows the, um, the action which triggered the most anxiety, you could say, the biggest fear on behalf of the public and also on behalf of museum people like us. Next slide, please. It's in October 2022 when two activists threw potato mesh on a painting from Claude Monet's Haystack series, which was bought by the museum owner Hasso Plattner in 2019 for 110.7 million US dollar. Um, well, I want to say that we did throw, did throw potato mesh on the glass in front of this picture. I'm happy you correct that because um, as a trained journalist myself, I was wondering, I mean, there's all kinds of arguments against what you do. Fair. But all these headlines saying that activists threw potato mesh on a painting were utterly misleading, no? It's not correct. Like what was being done was actually throwing potato mesh against a glass frame, which was protecting the painting. Yeah, what we do in our actions no, or in our protests, no matter whether they are street blockades or whether, um, I would say, um, symbolic protests similar to this, uh, we don't want to damage anything. So we research very carefully whether um, there is a glass in front of the painting. We only go on the street when there is a green traffic light for the pedestrians. So the cars are already, they don't have to stop because we go on the street, they're already standing still. Um, and I think there is, um, in the discussion about these protests, um, there, yeah, there are some details that are not necessarily always very well recorded, um, which I think with the paintings, we, did, we were able to correct it, but if people read headlines for the first time, it is definitely stuck in their minds. Um, but yeah, we always take care that we don't destroy um, paintings that are very valuable. Mm -hmm. Thanks. On the next slide, we see uh, two moms also. Rebecca, you, you introduced yourself specifically as a mom, um, or maybe that's not here. Um, they glued themselves to a dinosaur in a, in a natural history museum. Um, so for the past months, uh, all museums have been in preparations for the possibility of an attack like this. But, there has but I want to say for mm -hmm. the action actually with the dinosaur, we were invited three weeks later for a public discussion exactly in this space um, by the museum. And uh, also citizens from the area in Berlin were invited. It was very, um, very interesting discussion exactly at the place where it happened. 
And I think that shows something what we want to achieve with the protests is we want to um, establish a platform in order to have meaningful discussions, in order to lead the debate in a direction where we actually get our hands on and start doing something. And there we are at Studio Bonn in the yeah. Bundeskunsthalle, invited by an institution that is financed by the federal government. Welcome, Zoe. Um, of Letzte Generation, we have no choice then to talk to you uh, because you raised some issue we have to talk about. Uh, but why in the first place did you start to be part of Letzte Generation beginning last year? Why are you gluing yourself to the street? I think um, I've always been a person who thought I'm quite... I live very sustainable and I bought organic groceries um, and I've been also... My parents also raised me in a way that we always went on bike tours uh, instead of flying somewhere. Um, but at some point I realized, I would say two years ago, that there is this, only this, still this closing time frame, this limited time frame to still have some sort of control on the tipping points in our climate system. And I looked around myself and I kind of noticed that what our government is doing and the way how they are reacting to protests from, for example, Fridays for Future does not align with the physical reality. Um, and that kind of made me think that we do need a certain amount of pressure from society, from us as political citizens to, to get our government to a point where they listen to the urgency of the climate crisis. And just recently this week, um, uh, some colleagues of yours had a talk with the Minister of Transport of Germany, Volker Wissing, Volker mm -hmm. Wissing from the Liberal Party, um, who before the talk um, blamed Letzte Generation for um, getting into people's lives, blocking them from getting to work with claims that are much weaker than what the federal government is actually busy doing. I wouldn't say that the claims are much weaker, but I would definitely say we, cl we, we demand very simple things. And we demand, we de demand a speed limit on highways in Germany, we demand a 9 euro ticket um, for everyone instead of a 49 euro ticket. So 9 euros and you can use any regional train in yeah. Germany. Yeah, and we also demand um, that our government organizes um, a citizen assembly mm -hmm. um, that that pretty much um, then also <laughs> demands um, binding things um, as a democratic tool, which is actually in our coalition paper. And I think um, this unwillingness that we see also on the side of the minister, for example, to implement these things shows that we do have a certain political blockade. And um, it is simple things, but we don't, even, we don't even achieve these simple things right now. And I think that, that that's something that we also show with our protests is that it would be so easy to act with the first steps. It's not that our world is going to be safe afterwards, but it's, it helps to overcome this blockade that we see on a political level right now. Mm -hmm. And if these demands are fulfilled, if the nine euro ticket is implemented, it sounds so, so practical, like so real politics. Um, couldn't your demands also be more radical? Like, um, I th um, Stop fossil fuels, just stop oil is the claim of a actually related group in the in the UK. Um, I also increasingly have the feeling like many people are on your side and it's quite quite real politics um, claims mm -hmm. that you are that you are asking for. We through the demand that we that we want the government to initiate a citizen assembly, um, connected to that the citizen assembly is supposed to work under the topic how we can exit all fossil fuels until twenty thirty. So two thousand twenty thirty, that's the term I guess. Mm. Um, and we we are very well aware that we need to change the way how we're living. We need to change um, the way how we look at economics, for example. Um, but we think that this is a first step to tackle the bigger structural problems we are seeing because we do have this very practical closing time window, and we do need to act in, in, in the situation we are in right now. Um, but pers in perspective, we definitely need to overthink the entire way we're living right now. Mm. Some people really, really hate, hate you. Mm -hmm. um, and they are also pulling you from the streets on your hair. And um, do you have some understanding for that also? Like for the, 
like like hating this kind of righteousness you're blamed of this like um yeah going full in and trying to educate people do you do you understand the re resentment that also triggers i i i totally understand um the reactions on this on the street to a certain point <laughs> um because I also don't enjoy doing that. I know that these people just want to get to work and I know that these people just want to take their car to have a nice day on the lake and then there are people in their way and they stuck in traffic for half an hour or an hour. Um, and I, I do understand the resentment and the anger that is triggered by that. Um, and I wish I wouldn't have to trigger that anger and that mm -hmm. that yeah that frustration that kind of explodes on the streets there mm -hmm. um but i also see that this is the most effective but also the least disruptive um form of protest that we can use right now to achieve what um the pro protest in a democratic society should achieve and mm -hmm. that's that's um kind of yeah getting there where you can talk with mm -hmm. um, political actors. There's so much fear at stake right now. Um, like when you um, sit in front of uh, cars that actually threaten to, to run over you or let like the, the motors uh, um, scream. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's such a polarizing situation right now. And in the theater play uh, that Volker Lösch seen with um, two activists of Letzte Gener Generation, one of them being you, um, all these fear are also on stage, right? Mm -hmm. Like the fear of people your age, my age, lo also losing the conditions uh, of losing the conditions for life on earth. Um, the fear of protesters being overrun by cars or being um, um, treated violently by police. The fear of workers being blocked by protesters um, from getting to work in time, but also the fear of parents. Um, like, don't drop university, is the quote that I write, wrote down. Don't drop university, this scares me so much. Mm -hmm. So there's so much fear right now uh, that actually seems to rule this very polarized um, discussion. And I want to ask you, Rebecca, how you perceive um, the situation right now. What, what role does fear play in this discussion? I think it's huge. I was really, um, really touched by Zoe's um, use of the phrase, this, this closing window. Um, and it brought me in touch with the fear that I feel for the climate crisis. It also reminded me, um, oddly, of one of those disaster movies where the clock is ticking and the hero's got 30 seconds to fix the bomb or to get out from under the closing window. And I, I think we are, as human beings, we are very good at telling stories that help us to manage our fear. So it... Immediately I go to the story because, because I'm frightened by what Zoe says. Um, I, I guess too that I, I feel that in our society now, and I'm most familiar with the UK, but I would be surprised if it was very different here. There is, there is an increased backdrop of fear just in the way we lead our daily lives. Um, as people are frightened of losing their jobs, they're frightened of losing their homes, um, they're frightened of whether they can feed their children. Uh, they're frightened for their children's future, and that may be a climate fear, but it's also an ordinary fear. And it seems to me that those fears are playing out when, um, when drivers are yelling at the protesters and when they are dragging them up from um, off the road. Um, it may also be there when the climate minister is, is, when the transport minister is saying, nothing we can do, nothing we can do. There's a kind of helplessness, I think, that many people feel. He actually now, says we're doing so much already. We're doing so much already. There's no more we can do. But I think there's, I think probably what is going on um, alongside the fear is a displacement of the fear into anger. And that's what you can see in the protests. Um, but it is what humans do, isn't it? When, when we feel frightened and we don't have the chance to process the fear, we turn it into anger. Um, and that is very damaging. It's what's behind a lot of the polarization that I think mm -hmm. we see now. Mm -hmm. Lou, um, I actually learned in a talk that you once gave that fear and anger are produced by the same part in the body, the amygdala. Um, could you maybe... Tell us what you, what you researched about the amygdala and how it works and 
regulates fear and anger. Ten years ago, I did a work called Rust for King Kong Coin. It has a special organ, a very small organ called adamellin, and it regulates a lot of uh, very bad emotions like anger and fear. It is a conduit that transmits this kind of bad emotions. Then I discuss fear and anger through religion and Buddhism. When you feel very angry, then you don't feel fear anymore. You can see that when you have more intensive emotions, other weaker emotions will be covered. You don't feel those emotions anymore. For example, turning fear into anger. That's a very interesting topic. In that work, when I discussed fear, or rather anger, I made a statue of anger that's related to Buddhism from Tibet. A lot of statues from Buddhism look very angry and look very scary. Some people ask, why are they like Buddhas? when they looked so angry. I think that's the wisdom of Buddhism. We often use our own experience as a reference. Say we see a snake or a lion or a ghost, we link what we see to fear. If we see something that's similar, even before they start to affect us, we will feel fear. So in Buddhism, there's a lot of discussion about how we can get rid of fear. We should not establish this kind of link. We should not use a reference point. So that's an approach. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, yeah. So in my work, when we die, then we will meet those angry Buddhas. Those people, the dead, would really be fearful of those Buddha. And because of the fear, they will be dragged into hell, to another cycle, the next cycle. But we need to know that we don't have a physical body anymore after death. It cannot be destroyed. We don't need to be afraid of anything anymore. So that's how religion approaches it. But in terms of neuroscience, human beings are like a machine. There are many different emotions that can lead to fear. For example, well, the, the roots in the, uh, the, the brain are different, and fear can be connected in many different ways. So that's what my work is about. Yeah, I absolutely get that. Fear seems to be like absent, actually, from your work in a superficial way. Um, a superficial glance. Um, there's more angry faces than fearful faces. So that's also a question I wanted to ask you anyway. Like if, if fear is like kind of the, the suppressed or like the hidden driver uh, of, of a lot of your work, like turn, turning fear into anger, into action, into, into mutation, into like overcoming um, 
the fear of death, overcoming the fear of like losing yourself, losing your body. Well, that can be a hypothesis. If you don't have a physical body, then it can be not be destroyed. Our premise is that when we have a body, it can be destroyed, and you'll feel pain, and the world can be destroyed, and wealth can be taken away. And there's the pain of loss. Because of the connections and links, we will have fear for the future, even though we haven't really felt it. We fear what hasn't happened yet. But this might also lead to action. Like the panelists just said, the protests, they use protests to gravitate society, to prevent things from happening. But if you do that, you will keep feeling afraid of things that haven't happened. Mm -hmm. Can you relate to that, Zoe? Like, how does the Buddhist-inspired dealing with loss um, relate to the anger-driven dealing I would, of the activism on the streets. I would say I can clearly relate to what you just said um, at the very end, um, that this fear can also somehow be tackled and kind of feel like it, uh, like you can, you, you find a way of dealing with that fear mm. through starting to act and not, um, not um, yeah, stay still um, and be, kind of like frozen through your fear. Mm. I w and I would say through my personal experience, um, this fear kind of led into action and then led into me being hopeful again because I also saw through acting um, and and kind of thinking about the possibility how we can still, we, we're gonna keep living in the future and we're gonna keep acting, but we do have um, we do have the possibility to decide how we want to act. And I think this, this hope that we can still decide to act according to the climate crisis helped me to also overcome the fear mm -hmm. that I see, um, that I feel most strongly um, when, I, when I sense that we are not acting according to the circumstances. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Lou, you... Um, Doku the Self, the work which I referenced before, for everyone who didn't see the work elect Electromagnetic Brainology of yours being displayed last year in the exhibition The Brain here in Bundeskunsthalle, let's get like a better picture of your work. Um, in Doku the Self, you actually take uh, an experience of extreme anxiety um, as a starting point, which is a, a plane crash a near plane, near plane crash that you were actually part of. Could you speak about Doku the Self and how it came about, please? It's like a half an hour movie um, and you should all see it. Well, actually, as I was creating this work of art, uh, well, I actually had always planned to do this work, even before uh, that near plane crash happened to me. But, um, and even before the pandemic. But um, then I also felt that I suddenly was inspired by something that I had never experienced before, this near plane crash. So I ended up actually doing this from home. I suddenly realized I wanted to understand what this meant for the world. 
So I was also seeing those news from from all over the world that really made us all sad and 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 hurt、um, during the pandemic. So actually, creating this work of art allowed me to forget about these news in a way. So I spent most of my time on this work, apart from sleeping and eating. Of course, I was working twenty four seven. Other than that, so. In many ways, this was based on my own personal experience, and I realized that I went. I had to go to Shenzhen and told them that this this has happened. So I was on the plane, and I suddenly realized that I could see Shenzhen outside. The city of Shenzhen, and then I suddenly realized that we were in trouble. But then suddenly I felt very relaxed, and I didn't quite understand what this was, what was happening to me. So actually, this is how I how I deal with things now as well. Actually,、um, when something happens to me that that raises emotions inside me, I just close my eyes and I try to think back what it was like while I was going into Shenzhen. So it's overbuilt effect. So it's about. What happened when you're flying with astronauts and what astronauts feel when they look back on the on the planet? So when you realize how small everything is and how how much smaller you yourself even are. You suddenly zoom out, and you understand how small things actually are. So describing how to find yourself, and all the scenes that we see in the the the, the piece of art, all of this is really zoomed out. So I understand that there's. Too much information out there, and I can't just use my own language to express all of it.、Um, but anyway,、um, go and see the the work for yourself.、Mm. Thank you. That's that's very that's very、um, moving and and palpable,、um, and it feels kind of violent to go like to practical stuff now. <laughs> but you have some slides ready、um, that that also show how the work was actually being done. I find it so interesting because you you really go far in the technology of motion capture, on the on the one hand, but you also go、um, into researching spiritual traditions and that kind,、um, a specific kind of dance.、Um, could you maybe tell a bit how how you produced Doctor Dusav, with all its dancing Buddhas and loose. <laughs> Uh, yes. So maybe let me share my screen, and I'll explain as I'm showing you the images. This piece was actually started sort of in late 2019, before the pandemic. This is in Indonesia. I've always been inspired, and I've always been very interested in Indonesian art and culture. I read a book that actually talked about legendas, which is a type of dance from Indonesia. And、um, they start practicing it at age of five or six. And in fact, it's all about the reflection the, to 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 create the muscles for that dance. So you need to start early on, four five. So they actually start training, and especially the facial muscles, to express those emotions. So what's peculiar about this is that they essentially dance with their faces, with their facial muscles. So actually, I took a team from Shenzhen. 
to actually look at this and to experience this for themselves. Now, we also wanted to go to India to also work with people who dance with their faces, essentially. These are actors from there. So I myself feel that I'm now actually creating this digital avatar. So and that's essentially what I wanted to do here. So I felt that these avatars, they don't need any training, so they essentially can just be, uh, uh, these people just don't need any training. So we can have one dancer who can actually be combined with dancer C. So we can even combine them, the upper body, the lower body of the two dancers. So even that's possible. And in the process of this, I was wondering, you know, do we actually have a body? Mm -hmm. I had a, another piece of art which I called Great Adventure of Material World. And this was actually about our awareness, um, our awareness vis-à-vis -vis our bodies. So in the process of producing this work of art, I was wondering, and uh, I felt in many ways bodies can be a tool. Mm. I also looked into Parkinson's and understood that the moment their brains change, they suddenly actually have changes within their, in the rhythms as well. And actually, this is something that you'd also see on, um, with other technical things. So, in many ways, you can actually recreate this on the computer as well. So, essentially, there's, there's a way of, of um, counter-directional support that we can give here. In the past, actually, people tried to actually detach this as well and just kind of create, have their physical bodies detached from, from everything else. Well, essentially, and, and, and also create a, a physical body from other parts. So this is images from Bali. This is um, when we actually dealt with the digital bits that we put together. I also used my own face and I put it on a body without a gender, just a physical body. And that's essentially the, how I created this very um, technical work of art. So this is images of um, different expressions on my face. And then I actually used the expressions of other dancers and put them onto my body. And then there is this overlap. But I understood that, you know, the, the, every individual's movement of the face actually has limits. So but this is what it looks like in the result. So this is um, actually an older type of format, and the, the technology that we have today is much better already than what I used at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, this digital character here, of course, I had some uh, demands as to what it looks like. So, um, actually, I've, I've experimented with this before in an earlier piece of art, and I created something very similar. I feel that what I did there already is already very Buddhist in its essence. Yourself are a soul, and essentially you're being attached to a physical body. Actually, there's a lot of taboo-ridden aspects of it. So especially in 2015, um, the, the person in that piece actually died. So when I was producing this art, this piece, there was, um, there was this effect that actually made it look quite um, 
能把自己沉浸进去。Fan, quite, quite, quite um, defined by fantasy, quite fancy, imaginative. So these are kind of excerpts from it. This is me on the plane. 就就是跟那个城市，呃，有一个平行。This is actually when I'm in parallel with the city. 就它飘到宇宙里面，就这是一些。And this is in an oasis. That's where we end up. This is actually from the. Piece as well. Screenshots from it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, this idea of reincarnation. Uh, different reincarnations. This is actually the the data that I used from Indonesia that I collected there, and I put it onto this body, essentially. And this is the scariest bit. Hell. This is me in hell, essentially, or essentially hellish me, as it were. And this is zooming out, really, and visiting the world from from this zoomed out perspective. This is the return of life, the the wheel of life, and which is, of course, a very important concept in Buddhism. So here you have to choose the the life that you want, and actually you can't. You don't have much of a choose, much of a choice in Buddhism. So it's determined for you how you'll reincarnate. Now this is essentially the world that we are dealing with as people. That's not necessarily the world that we fit into best, but it's essentially determined for us in Buddhism anyway. And it's only up to a point that, um, that that essentially that this choice is being made for you, and there's there's no way for you to actually leave that decision being made for you. This is me in under the sea. This is where my tears essentially create a sea. This is um, a mountain created of corpses of the bones that are left over, the skeletons. So I understood that, that you know, uh, according to Buddhism, that there might be actually quite a lot of tests and trials, and only then can we actually get to that next stage. So this is me essentially uh, among the stars. And I disintegrate into pieces. That's because we essentially explore the world through our senses. When we see something that we like or we don't like, then essentially we engage in this binary, good, nice, tasty, not tasty. And all of these ideas, though, they, we actually collect them throughout our lifetimes. And then we actually use it to compare it to things that we see in the future, the experience in the future. And then the idea here is, is to work with qi, the concept of qi. This is me on the plane again. And some of my thoughts as to what's happening, this, this disaster that we see in the world. When the, the pandemic was particularly bad, um, I've, I have disappearing images of this. And even now, this still captures um, th th these events, so um, all of the bigger disasters and catastrophes that we, that we see in the world, and that's roughly it. Thanks so much, Lu. Um, I really recommend to see the whole film. Just Google Lu Yang Doku the Self with all this incredible music and the throat singing. Um, I didn't expect this, but I feel melancholic and also threatened right now. Um, it's a feeling connect like that I also had watching Doku the Self. I felt more euphoria also at the same time. But I wonder now what this melancholy is that I feel. And I think it has to do with 
your whole introduction also how you use technology as the big source next to Buddhism in your work um, to look outside of the self, look back on concepts of the self, of our connection to our own body, which also implements a certain model of society. And I would like to ask you, Rebecca, what, um, what you would say. <laughs> do you feel the same melancholy? And do you think, or how would you describe the challenge of the shifts we are going through right now? And it's certainly not only climate change, but also has to do with technology. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that these shifts are a challenge to the concept of the self that we have inherited? I think it's a huge challenge to our, our sense of ourselves and our sense of our relationships with others and with the world. Um, and um, all the time listening to, to Lu Yang talking through the, the thinking and the, um, and the images behind the film, I was remembering a phrase from the film which is um, something like, the fear that I feel now in the moment comes from the archive of the mind. Um, and I have a um, completely different uh, inherited tradition that I work with, which is Western psychoanalysis and related fields. And psychoanalysis, many psychoanalysts say, um, the fear that we feel now, the fear of the catastrophe to come, is the catastrophe that has already happened. And by that they mean the catastrophe of being born, the being expelled from the womb, of suddenly finding that you have to do things for yourself, uh, losing the warmth, losing the predictable environment, um, and also smaller but still huge um, experiences of being tiny and overwhelmed by what is happening around one and losing the, um, the, the familiar and important caregiver. Um, because the caregiver goes away for a moment and we think it's the end of the world. And so those, those feelings, of course, as we get older, they become, we, we forget about them and they become less um, important to us, but they're still there in many ways. And I think they come up again in all the small fears that we get. So for me, coming here today and coming, coming to Germany from England and the small anxious feelings that I have about that, um, will I get lost? Will I talk in, in, in self-referential English and nobody will understand? Um, will, I, will I look an idiot? You know, those kinds of social fears, all of those also carry the terror of the tiny baby, I think, um, and the in the archive of the mind. And so what that, what, what, what that means is that we, when we feel fear, it is a version of loss. It is, comes from the loss, the sense of absolute deprivation that we, we experience as tiny children. Mm -hmm. And in order to process loss, you have to grieve, you have to mourn it, you have to respect it. And that's, for me, the connection between climate fear and climate grief is that we're fearing the loss that has already happened, the loss of connection with nature, the loss of the world we have grown up with, the loss of our privilege, perhaps, um, and all of those are losses that have already happened, mm -hmm. and we need to grieve them. Mm -hmm. So interesting, really, because uh, what Lou speaks about is without this idea of an origin or a source, right? It's, um, it's like what all post-structuralist criticism of psychoanalysis was also about. Like, if you feel you're turning into a wolf, then turn into a wolf. Don't go back to your father. <laughs> become like become whatever you feel like, and and this much more seems to relate to Bu Buddhism. Whereas um, from what you say, I feel the gravity of the European idea of the self. Like go back to the father, go back to the mother, go back to your original pain. Um, so we have two very different concepts of being in the world in the in the, in the space and. Um, Maybe that's a good moment to start the exercise. Sure. And see what we actually feel, right? Yeah. This will be a bit boring for Lou um, because we're not in the same space. We might need like five to 10 minutes. Um, we are now stopping the cameras. Um, we are stopping the sound recording. We are stopping our microphones. 
because we also will convene. Welcome back, dear viewers on the screen. Um, we have now spent 10 minutes without you. Um, sorry, but feel invited to also join the exercise afterwards. Um, something has changed in this room, I feel, and we want to find out what it was. Rebecca, may I turn the moderation to you? So I will say a little first about our experience, if I may, mm -hmm. um, or my experience of, being, of working with the two of you, doing, doing the same thing that we were asking everyone here to do. Um, I felt um, uh, strange, you know, here we are in a theatre setting, in a studio. Um, I felt, I don't know whether we can do this. I felt lots of interruptions or a sense of lots of other things going on around us. But then when... You started speaking, Kolya, um, and you named some of your responses to the feather that you were holding. Where's it gone? What have you done with it? You've still got it. <laughs> um, I began to feel the feelings move between us. Um, and um, when Zoe was speaking um, about the dry seed head that she's holding and the feelings that she had, and you notice I'm not reporting on your feelings because this is private, really. Um, again, I felt a connection to the climate crisis um, and through, through us, through the connections between us, but through the connections that we also have to these, these small creatures, these small things. I'm also aware that for some people, doing, doing something like this feels, how did you put it in the social media, esoteric, a bit weird. Um, and that may be the case for, for some of you tonight. And we would love to hear anything about your experience that you're happy to share um, and it can be you know bafflement puzzlement this is a bit weird or there may have been something meaningful some some emotion that you became aware of in your group um, and the, the microphone is there if you would like to come up we would love to hear from you Maybe as long as you make up your minds, if you actually want to talk, um, I want to credit another previous guest at Studio One Global Nerve Systems, the artist Grace Ndiritu, um, who spoke in the last Studio One about interdependence and everything being connected, actually based on a grant study by the Institute for Human and Environmental security by the UN University, which is just next door, uh, who co-authored co also the first Studio Bonn, and they will also come back in November. Sita Sebesvari, the head author, will present the next study. Um, I learned a lot from preparing to um, speak to Grace, who traveled the world and um, spent time with people living with all possible kind of knowledge systems and practices. And um, with Grace, I also learned there is something as climate psychology, which I didn't know before. Or that there is a professional scientific term, climate trauma. Yeah. Um, maybe, Rebecca, could you tell us a bit how you actually became a climate psychologist and what climate trauma is? I became a climate psychologist because I was interested in climate communication. Um, how it is that we talk about the climate crisis in, in public, um, how, we, um, how government in those days, 10 years ago, was encouraging consumers to think of themselves as um, able to uh, you know, reduce their carbon footprints. And the language that was being used that was so meaningless, you know, um, turn, your, turn your kettle off, don't fill it too full, put, unplug your phone... Um, and, and some, as if this, th these tiny things, as if that was going to address this huge crisis. So I became interested in the tininess and the hugeness and the way they were playing out together. And so I did a, I did a, a doctorate at the Tavistock Clinic in London, exploring the uh, psychosocial dynamics of what is going on in organisations where climate is part of the work, but also in society um, more broadly. And um, as part of that work, I came... I came um, I encountered the idea of climate trauma, um, which draws from um, uh, trauma scholarship, the scholarship of people who've experienced trauma, 
to explore the idea that as a society, as a collection of societies, we are experiencing collective climate trauma. Um, this, the, the climate crisis is something that is too big for our minds to understand. Um, it is too violent for us to be able to manage, uh, to, to contemplate, to, um, to face. We feel helpless and small in relation to it, so we feel that we have no control over what is happening. Um, and when we are paying any attention to it at all, we notice the loss and loss and loss of species, of other, other creatures on the world, um, that, is a, that is a traumatic experience. Climate is also so polarised. Um, there's so much hatred, as you and, you and Zoe were talking about earlier. Um, and so there is always a sense of being under attack by, you know, wh wherever you are in the climate debate, if there is one, you feel under attack, you feel um, attacked by others. And those, kinds, those things combined with the, um, what some people call the epistemological trauma of thinking about climate, you know, that it is, it's, it's kind of impossible. Like um, the parameters of our perception yeah, we are not can't. fit yeah. to equip us for yeah. the capacity for actually understanding. Yeah. Yeah. That's and so problem. what? And so what? Um, and and I, th I think the argument is that we we can't heal this trauma because we're all part of it. But what we can do is share it mm -hmm. between ourselves um, and not expect to be healed, not expect to be fixed, but expect not to be left alone with it. And if we can be, if we can come together as three people, as we were on the floor just now. Um, or groups of groups of three or four, just just for a few minutes, to find words for some of those feelings, break the taboo that exists around this, um, and thereby begin to to um, open up the trauma. Then we have some chance of surviving what is what we know is coming, and mitigating some of what we don't yet know. Um, we may be in a better place to to understand the uncertainty and to accept the uncertainty and not insist on everything will be fine or the world will end tomorrow, which is where we go when we're traumatized. It's insistence on optimism mm. or insistence on catastrophe. Mm. Thank you. And that's actually the, the, the core of the idea of this series of Studio One, um, to not talk about what we have to do, but like allow the, the parameters of our perception and of our senses to shift, yeah. open. And that's not esoteric. That is something which is like the root of, at the roots of our recognition. There, there is one more thing I might mm -hmm. add, um, but I'm hoping that there are people coming down to the microphone, um, which is that some psychologists say that we have uh, we, we have not only lost um, the safety of the womb and the safety of being a tiny baby with a reliable mm -hmm. caregiver, but we have lost our connection with the rest of the world, with the, um, the, with the other creatures. Mm -hmm. And part of what we're doing here is to try to regain a little bit of that connection um, and create what my kind of psychologist calls containment through that. Um, relationship, connection, and finding words together for something. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody who would like to share their experience? Hello. 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 Well, thank you for giving the floor. I'm sorry for giving you my back. Um, well, I would like to first say Mrs. Nesta was um, quite a new experience for me. I had to hold myself not to ask any question. Um, I'm quite an extroverted person, so I need to ask. And um, I came here with, actually, I want to ask two questions to the panelists, if that's fine. Um, my first question is for Zoe. The interpreters would Being like to apologize. Being myself, no uh, climate activist as well, not right now, but in the past. Um, I personally disagree with the fact of gluing yourself to the floor to uh, bring the climate message across. Um, and 
I want, my question is, you said that it was the most effective way to, to get the message across, and I want to ask you how do, what is effectiveness for you in that sense, what does it mean, and how do you measure it? And uh, I have a question for Mrs. Nestor as well. Um, being of the more or less same generation as your son, and in this sinking ship, um, what would be perhaps um, your advice to a generation like, like mine, which I'm an optimist person, but towards climate change, I feel, I feel quite pessimistic about it, and I wanted to hear perhaps your, some encouraging words if possible, but I know it's quite hard. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think the first question was for you, Zoe. Yeah, I hope I got it all because there was um, sound in my ear while you talked as well. Um, I, I see civil disobedience in the way how we practice it, practice it sorry my English, um, in this disruptive way as a most effective tool that we have. Um, because it's, if you look at historical uh, changes that happened historically, whether it's the, the way how women fought for their right to vote, or also how um, you've seen shifts in other parts of the world. Um, it's, it's a way to, to trigger and to motivate a certain change in a very limited time frame. Um, which then can trigger a long-term change, but it's um, the exactly most so. effective way to put so. pressure on the government. And I would say, so. looking at the way, um, I can't, um, right now I'm not the person who, <laughs> who's so good in statistics, but um, if we look at last Genera January, there were 20, not even 20 people on the street who, who started these street blockades. And now we're here um, about a year later and they're, about 800 people to 1,000 people who take it to the streets in Berlin right now, um, I would say there is uh, already this effectiveness in the sense of it does reach people, it does motivate people, and we do see that um, there's more pressure in the sense on the debate on the climate crisis that um, Oberbürgermeister, so uh, mayors, mayors of, of the cities, mm -hmm. um, support exactly the content of this and support this debate in a different way they've been doing before. And there are a bunch of these kind of, um, I would say, um, contributions that, that were introduced in our way of dealing with the climate crisis again, because there is the pressure um, of citizens and we wouldn't, have to, we wouldn't have to deal with this topic as much in the political debate if there would not be people taking it to the streets and not going away. As a very short answer that didn't cover all aspects, but. Thank you. Um, if, and if I can encroach on, on your area for a moment, I think that even if you didn't feel that what you were doing was effective, there is something very, very powerful in, in acting in alignment with your beliefs that um, would be part of my answer to you. Um, it's not, I think, to do with um, uh, everybody should be an activist, but I think that we live in a very, um, we live in a society where most of the time we are not able to act in accordance with what we know to be true. And so we, uh, we have to live with these contradictions and a sense of complicity and um, even, um, you know, moral injury, the sense of we are, we are contributing to the damage. And that is uh, almost unbearable, I think. And so finding some ways to do things that feel more in alignment with what you know to be needed is, is helpful. But I think what is, um, if there was just one thing, that I would say to you, it is connect with each other and grieve together because out of that comes energy and love. And love is what we're missing, I think. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for being brave. Thank you. Is there anyone who would voice some question or experience? Hi, so I'm Andy, and I'd like to thank you for the talk and to share my experience about this natural object I had. And I think it is 
a little stack of seeds from a tree um, that I used to play with as a child also, and mostly to destroy it by rubbing it between my fingers. Um, so looking at it made me, um, for a reason I can't really explain, um, very sad. And um, yeah, it almost looks like a little caterpillar or something, some, something that's living, and it's so e easily destructible. And um, I think most of us view nature as something that is destructible and can be changed, and we engage in it very efficiently uh, as a species. And um, But we are shocked when something created by humans is being destroyed by catastrophes or other things. And um, I don't know if that's very logical uh, to think that way. I don't think so. Um, so I think the trauma caused by the change that is going to happen, whether um, we succeed in like um, bringing the temp keeping the temperature quite cool or whether we, we fail, um, change is going to happen and um, the trauma that's being caused is going to be even bigger if we can't um, deal with that reality that human things are as destructible as nature is. Um, but, and to come back to this object, if it is destroyed, um, there's the possibility for new things to grow out of it. Um, so that adds up to what you already said. Um, we can't really know what's going to happen and what is going to change and what is going to positively to grow out of it and what is going to yeah, be harmful for us and everybody. That's it. Yeah. Thank Beautiful. you. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We are approaching um, the end of the talk and I would like to start um, the last round of questions and I would like to start uh, with you, Lou. Um, and I would like to ask you how it f feels for you to listen to Germans, um, British, um, maybe former, former colonialist uh, power descendants, um, to speak about our feelings towards loss. Um, and from your dealing with Buddhism and everything you have done to deal with your own anxieties and fears, is there some, something, some recommendation? I would ask each of you, if there's something that you would recommend to let go of. And I would like to start with you, Lou. Well, things that we can let go of. There are so many things that we can let go of, but we can't do that. We keep holding on to things. That's, we have, that's why we have such emotions. Or some people can let go, but most people can't. But one of the panelists said, some people might live in a sustainable way, but most people don't choose such a lifestyle. Perhaps we need more time. Perhaps we need time to raise awareness, to create greater fear. So that they can take responsibilities for the issues that they are actually causing, so that they can take action. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, what do you think we should let go of? Um, I think that we should could and should, I guess, um, let go of the feeling that that change is not going to happen um, in the sense of it's not going to happen to us here it, it, because it's already happening. And I think we should all, especially living in a very privileged position and um, living in a country 
um, like Germany, that is a very privileged country in the way how we exploit other countries, but also in the way how we do have possibilities um, to, to trigger change, is um, to, we should let go of not feeling like we're part of it and not feeling responsible to what's happening all around the world. Yeah, that's Thank it. you. Rebecca, what do you recommend? Um, very similar to Zoe, I think, um, would be my first thought. But let me, let me see if I can develop, develop that um, uh, so that I'm not just repeating what you said. Um, I think that we, need, we do need to let go of the, the, the fear that, that I acknowledge that I have as a privileged person that um, climate change will mean I lose that privilege. Um, because partly because it's probably not true um, that with increased um, with increased temperatures and unlivable parts of the world um, there will be um, you know, privileged places and less privileged places. Um, so I do think it's important that we try to let go of that feeling, which is essentially which then essentially becomes a kind of dis council of despair. The idea that. Um, Climate change is bad because it means that uh, I won't get my really good coffee in the mornings anymore. Um, and that's the kind of mentality that gets um, appealed to by advertising and by the press, isn't it? You see articles saying, um, oh, coffee's at risk, and that means climate change is really bad. But actually, what we need to be engaging with is the, um, is, is, is this, the questions of our common humanity across mm -hmm. the world, which those ideas about my coffee are actually going to make much harder to access. Mm -hmm. um, and I would just like to acknowledge that it's very hard for, um, for all of us brought up in, in a privileged um, context to, to let that go. Privilege is something that people hold on to for dear life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they have learned to do that. Yeah. And I think it has something to do also with the seven mountains, where you got these objects. I mean, this is from the roof of a public institution, but most of the objects that you were holding were from the seven mountains, um, which with their myth building, um, were on the root of the society and the economic system we are living in today, like industrial capitalism, right? And from that time, we inherited many amazing and great things like new modes of cooperation and new modes of like turning nature to our profit or other people too. But we also, I think, inherited a very heavy, inflated, hyperbolic self. And that is hard to carry. And it is really sad to let go of that. But it's also, I imagine, liberating. That's what I take away also, especially from the talk with Lou today. And I want to thank you all for coming. Thanks, Lou, for staying up half of your night. Thanks, Rebecca, for coming from Oxford, the partner city of Bonn. And thank you, Zoe, for coming from Berlin. And this was Studio Bonn. Global Nerve Systems, how to cope with fear. Please follow Bundeskunsthalle on social media for updates for the next talks. Check Studio Bonn IO for all previous 12 Studio Bonn talks. And follow the podcast Studio Bonn in your preferred podcast app. And save the date 8 November when Sita Sebeswari of the UN University will come back and present the next report on interdependency. And possibly shared, um, possibly. Um, Aisha Devi will also share the panel, whose song Mazda from our opening video we will now hear again. Have a good night. <laughs>